LBO model. Let's take a look at the components of CFI's LBO model. It includes all of the regular components of a three statement and operating financial model. It has operating scenarios, so you can pick base case, upside, or downside cases for the operation of the business. Then it includes transaction assumptions, such as financing, debt tranches, takeover premium, etc. From there, we can calculate debt and interest schedules. This is a major component of a leveraged buyout model, as it uses as much debt as possible. Ultimately, we can calculate the levered internal rate of return, or the equity IRR, and perform analysis of returns by investor type. Lastly, we'll perform sensitivity analysis to see how the IRR is impacted by changes in different assumptions. The purpose of the LBO model could be a few things. One could be to value a target business because this LBO model has a DCF built into it. It can also be to determine how much to pay for an acquisition. What will the IRR be at certain acquisition prices? It's also used to assess how much leverage a company can handle. It can be used to figure out what the maximum equity IRR possible is. It can be used to evaluate scenarios and perform sensitivity analysis to see the range of outcomes. And lastly, it can be used as a marketing tool to obtain financing and make an investment decision. The relevant courses for learning to build this model are the Business Valuation Modeling course and this LBO modeling class that teaches you how to build the model from scratch. Here we are inside the LBO model. From the cover page, we can click through directly to the actual model. And in the model, you can see that it's all on a single tab. All of the sections are organized with grouping, and there are quite a few sections. LBO models are very advanced and challenging to build. Let's open up all of the sections and take a closer look. We start with the assumptions, and here are the operating scenarios. We have three distinct operating scenarios, base case, upside case, and downside case, that flow into the live case. We also have assumptions that are general inputs about the transaction. We have error checks. We have a purchase price information. Here is where the leverage kicks in. These are the different types of financing that are used for the LBO transaction. Beneath that, we've got sources and uses of cash, goodwill, and PPA. Credit metrics that show us how levered this transaction is. Then we build in a traditional three-statement model. We believe this helps understand the transaction and the company and ties everything together and increases confidence. Even though many LBO models don't have three-statement models, we believe it's best practice to include a full three-statement model. So here are the three statements all linked up. Then we have the supporting schedules for working capital, depreciation, and of course the debt and interest schedules, which become quite long in an LBO model, and you can see here all the different tranches of debt. Beneath that, we have the closing balance sheet. This is where we make the adjustments for the acquisition, and we have a new balance sheet for the company that drives forward. We also include a traditional DCF model in this LBO. Not all LBO models include DCF models, but we also believe this is best practice and that you should. So here's the DCF model. We calculate both the unlevered and the levered rates of return. So you can see here the unlevered IRR and the levered IRR for this transaction. Here are the IRRs by investor type, the cash on cash return for the sponsor, sensitivity analysis, and finally charts and graphs to display the output of the model. So as you can see, this is a very robust model and a very advanced form of financial modeling. In the next chapter, we'll show you at how some of the changes in assumptions can impact the transaction economics. Let's take a look at how different operating scenarios and different amounts of leverage flow through the model and impact the sponsor's internal rate of return. In this model, we've conveniently put the sponsor IRR above the fold here, meaning that wherever we scroll down to in the model, we can always see the sponsor IRR. This way, we can see what happens to it no matter what we change in the model. Let's scroll back up to the top. We've also put above the fold here the case that's being run through the model. We've started with the base case that has a 26.6% IRR. Let's run the upside case through the model. The upside case 
gets a higher IRR, close to 31%. And then the downside case gets an 18.7% IRR. Whichever case is selected, in this case downside, is the one that flows through the live case section of the model. Let's put it back to the base case here. And we can also see down below how adding leverage to this deal can increase the IRR. It's already highly levered at 4.7 turns of EBITDA. But let's just suppose for a minute here that we have the ability to take term loan to another full turn of EBITDA to three times. If we do that, you can see that the amount of debt increases and the sponsor equity decreases, which in combination causes the sponsor's IRR to increase dramatically. Now, this may be too much leverage and the company may not actually be able to support it. We're just showing you conceptually how this flows through the model. At the same time, if we were to take this down to zero turns of EBITDA, you can see that the sponsor has to write a bigger equity check. By writing a bigger equity check and using less leverage, they get a lower internal rate of return. So essentially, the private equity firms are working to get this maximum leverage that they can and thus get the highest internal rate of return that they can. This is the essence of the LBO model.